So I would like to introduce some pioneers and leaders in our industry for our first panel. We have Julian Hillman, CEO of Realty Mobile. We have okay. Tim Sullivan. CEO Micro hey, how are you? Ventures. Okay. Um, we have Lane McLaughlin. There you are. <coughs> Lane uh, leads business development for Folio Institutional. Um, Steve Ferrando, Chief CIO of Crowdclear. <laughs> And is, is Jonathan Medved here yet? I know I, I got a call. His plane, was, um, his plane was a little bit delayed. So as soon as he comes, he'll probably just jump right in. So we'll, we'll, we'll just get started. <coughs> Great. So you know, I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to our first panel, uh, which is the introduction to Piper's panel. We kind of touched upon it in the presentation there. Uh, private, Piper stands for Private Issuers Publicly Raising. And since the SEC's implementation of Title II of the Jobs Act, thousands of companies have opted to take advantage of general advertising uh, via the SEC, the, via the 506C exemption. And um, this panel, we are fortunate enough to have with us some of the leading portals that are structuring these type of offerings. Um, and, are, and also are supplying the intermediaries with the technology and compliance support that are necessary to, to facilitate these transactions. And what we're, you know, what, what we're, we're fortunate that we have um, you know, a really diverse group of, of leaders here that could really shed light on a lot of various, um, of, a lot of industries and insight into specific markets. So what I'm going to actually have, uh, if you guys could each take a few minutes and, and introduce yourselves and give yourself some shameless plugs for your companies, because you, you're all doing amazing things, that would be great. Want me to start? Yeah. Right. yeah. I'm Jillian Hellman, and I'm the CEO of RealtyMogul.com, and we do crowdfunding for real estate. So we're a marketplace for accredited investors to pool capital online and buy shares of pre-vetted real estate investments like apartment buildings, retail shopping centers, office buildings, and also pools of single family homes. Uh, we've been in business about nine months and we've crowdfunded 35 properties now. So we've got a pretty good track record on the types of properties we've been crowdfunding. We're a national platform. So we're willing to do investments anywhere in the United States. And over the last nine months, we've been exclusively focused on real estate that cash flows. So we look to provide either a monthly or a quarterly distribution to our investors on every transaction that we do. And we've distributed back over $700,000 to date to investors. My name is, <coughs> excuse me, Tim Sullivan. I'm the CEO of MicroVentures. We are an equity crowdfunding platform. We've been around for about two and a half years. We are a broker dealer. Um, we focus on technology startup companies. We let our investors crowdsource the opportunities. So, you know, we're not the smartest guys in the room. We feel like the people on our platform are. Um, we've raised money for 51 companies so far, over $30 million in the last uh, year and a half. So things are moving pretty well. Hi, my name is Blaine McLaughlin, and I work for Folio Institutional, in particular in business development. And Folio Institutional, as hopefully you'll learn more from me and a couple other folks who are here today, is a clearing broker, and in particular that means that we do the custody and of uh, both cash and securities for both public and private securities, uh, the private piece being the more recent addition. So if you think of us as the back end or the plumbing underneath uh, every broker-dealer in, in the U.S. doing private securities, that would be the vision that we're looking to achieve today. Hi, I'm Steve. Excuse me. I'm Steve Ferrando, uh, founder and CIO of Crowdclear. Crowdclear is a division of Bendigo Securities, which is a FINRA registered broker dealer. Um, we support funding portals in doing Pipers um, and other online securities transactions. We provide all of the regulatory and compliance functions required to uh, to do these things under the existing regulations. We vet the deals and we vet the investors. We handle the cash, um, and that's what we're doing. Great. 
So Tim, maybe we'll start with you. Um, you know, Tim, Tim also, so you know, he's also the, the former president of Shares Post, so he's really a pioneer both in, in you know, in the, what's happening now in the primary markets, but also in the secondary markets as well. So I think we're, we're going to be able to draw some really incredible insight. Um, Tim, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the types of, of Piper offerings that you're seeing on the MicroVentures platform. Sure. So um, I think, you know, when general solicitation was, was passed, and companies were suddenly allowed to, to go out to the general public, there was a lot of, of fear, you know, how is this going to uh, work, how, how are companies going to react, how is the general public going to react. There was a lot of, uh, uh, there were a lot of questions around something Dara brought up earlier, you know, can investors make decisions for themselves or, or does the government need to really participate in their decision making process. Um, what we found is that's not really the problem. The problem is who's going to manage these investors. Once you go out to, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people with an offering, um, you're not going to you're not going to be able to get a hundred thousand people on your cap table. And and if you're setting up entities to try to funnel those people, and those people are also going to be managed. So there becomes a a pretty big issue with actual management of investors. And and we're finding that to be kind of the the the, the stoppage point or or the uh, the the path of or resistance in the path. Um, so what we're still doing, we've, we've done a few general solicitation offerings. They've gone okay, but we're really probably more, you know, heading back towards 506 uh, standard offerings, you know, private placements that, that you're used to. So 506B. B, yeah. So how, how, many, how many investors are you seeing, like, in, in the 506Cs, you know, is it, is it really getting up there to, to like, 1,000, in the, 2,000? In the Cs or the Bs? In the Cs. Um, I mean, we're not really doing the, the Cs just because it's, uh, it's a management disaster right, right now. So, I mean, I, I think there's going to be a, a, there's a pain point right now for uh, investor relations firms to, to come in and, and manage that process for 506C offerings, but um, it, as far as I know, it hasn't happened yet. Maybe you guys can weigh in on that. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a perfect lead-in for, for Blaine and, and for Steve. And Blaine, maybe you could start talking about a little bit of what Folio is doing to manage that. Yeah, yeah I, I wasn't prepped by Tim on this, so it's just kind of lucky. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me start at a slightly different place, though, is we've spent about 100 years coming up with a securities infrastructure and technology to support public equities and the management of, of investors in public equities. and. In many ways, the, the private industry, you call it 506B prior to Jobs Act, never really kept <coughs> up with that. You know, the process was pretty much paper-based. It was human-based. There wasn't an online version. And at the end, if you were lucky, and, and even for most companies doing the private raises today online, you still end up with a piece of paper at the end, which makes the investor management kind of a problem because corporate actions and, and tracking and who owns what uh, and all of those things don't really happen with pieces of paper in people's drawers. So. Um, what Folio is trying to do is leverage that public equities clearing and trading infrastructure to do the exact same thing for private. So if it's as easy as to go into your Folio account and click buy for IBM, we've made it as easy to click buy ABC company, electronically sign the documents, and become an owner, or specifically submit a subscription agreement for that private company so that at the end, when it fulfills, you have that private security in book entry form, in street name, in your account, just like you have IBM. And then a lot of the investor management stuff gets a lot easier because now your cap table is fully FN investment sync for the benefit of customers. You've got one, as, a, as an issuer, you've got one entry there for no matter how many holders there are at the underlying broker dealer. Um, that starts to make it a lot easier. And when the broker dealer then adds on things like uh, automated proxy distribution, voting, corporate action, uh, processing, online action on behalf of the customer, and, and any uh, return of capital or interest or dividends or whatever the other kind of corporate actions are, makes that, that whole management process a lot easier. So I wouldn't say we've got it nailed, um, but we've got experience in doing that for public companies and we're applying that same experience in the private space. No, you, Steve. No, we completely, we, we completely agree with Blaine and he knows this because we've talked about it. Um, we feel that book entry accounting for, um, for you know, both 506C offerings and then Title III offerings when they come out is going to be critical for the success of the industry. Um, you can't be distributing, you know, as you said, a thousand different share certs and then all of the, uh, the, 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 the complexities behind that. Um, interestingly, um, 
couple of us were, a couple of us within the industry were down in Washington um, a couple of weeks back at a small business forum, and we actually got a chance to speak to the SEC. Um, and I asked the, I asked the, the, the woman from the SEC, I said, were you really envisioning for Title III um, individual share certificates being, you know, distributed to, to all of the, the investors? She's like, absolutely not. We completely expect that that's going to be book entry. So, you know, supporting, you know, everything that Blaine has said, I think that's going to be important um, to the su success of current pipers. Um, Got to get used to that word. Um, and then uh, then Title III offerings, which, by the way, are supposed to be called 486s. Um, so, yeah, right. completely agree. So w what's interesting is, you know, also part of the JOBS Act was, was um, the uh, increase in the threshold um, of the shareholder threshold, so meaning you could you used to be where if you if you reached 500 shareholders, it triggered a, a filing with the SEC, and they increased that to 2,000. Um, but now, if let's say we're doing something through through Folio, um, and these are being held in street name, um, you know, they basically, you know, theoretically, you know, maybe you could talk about that because you know they can have a bazillion shareholders, and it won't matter if it's in street name. Is that correct? I think technically that's probably accurate. We're probably a little worried about a zillion. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I, I know Gene. What about a gazillion? Maybe a gazillion. You know, I, I know Gene, Gene and some others here would like to talk later about you know, how small can you make an investment in a company and still have that be viable. Um, as a, I'm not sure we actually want to get there, but as an example, what Folio said is today is our smallest uh, buy or sell increment is a penny. So um, that's in public securities, admittedly, but uh, because we happen to do everything in, in, or allow everybody to do everything in fractional shares, you can go pretty small in your tick size. Not that we want people to go there, but the idea is um, doesn't really matter how many holders there are uh, in a particular security at a clearing broker, it still shows up as a single line on the cap table for the issuer. And, uh, and my boss, Steve Wallman, is here somewhere, doesn't actually think that that makes a lot of sense, and I kind of agree with him, but um, that happens to be what the rule is, so we might as well leverage it and, and, and benefit from it. And, and maybe, uh, you know, Jillian, she, she, you, you are really focused on in, in the, the real estate space and you're using some of these Reg D exemptions also. Maybe you could talk about a little bit of how some of those deals are being structured there um, and changing how the crowd is financing that industry. Yeah, so there's a lot of skepticism from real estate companies. We, we started about a year and a half ago talking to real estate companies and, and heard the same thing time and time again, which was, I don't want 100 people in my transaction. You know, as the issuer, I don't want 100 people or I don't want 75 people. That's, you know, 75 K1, 75 distribution, 75 reports. And, and they just rolled their eyes and said, this crowdfunding thing isn't for us. And we agree. Um, so similar to, you know, what some of the other folks are doing, we pool everybody into a special purpose vehicle, typically an LLC, and we are one investor for that issuer. So very, very, very similar in the real estate industry. And it's actually even better for them. You know, historically, they might have had 10 investors or 15 investors uh, in a single property. And now we're one investor. So they do one K1, one distribution, one report. And our system and technology distributes that all out pro rata to the investors that own that underlying LLC and own those underlying shares. So very similar model. Interesting. And, and you know, I know you're also focused on, on cash flow. So maybe you want to just talk about that while you're talking about the, on the real estate side. Yeah, certainly. So the, the reason that we're focused on cash flow is because there are, are, there are our alternatives. And what I mean by that is in crowdfunding, we're competing with every other financial services product for share of wallet. Investors who are investing in peer-to-peer -peer lending or in crowdfunding or any other vertical in crowd finance have the ability to invest in stocks. They have the ability to invest in bonds, in real estate investment trusts, and in other alternatives like metals, gold, silver, and, and other alternatives. And we went out and surveyed a couple hundred accredited investors before we ever started this business. And we kept hearing time and again that they want income. And specifically with interest rates so low, they want to generate meaningful income. And I think that's one of the big reasons that Lending Club and Prosper have been so successful is that you know, they have consistently provided dividends uh, and capital back to their investors. So we have the exact same focus. Uh, we are a debt-based crowdfunding website and an equity-based crowdfunding website. So on our debt investments, the underlying security is a real estate loan, and we pay distributions monthly. And on our equity investments, where we're buying shares in an apartment building or a retail shopping center, we're paying distributions on a quarterly basis. The other thing that I think is important about that is risk, right? Anytime that you're in any financial product, you're looking at risk and return, and we don't want to take undue risk. So we don't do any ground-up development. 
when you're investing in real estate that has existing cash flow, inherently there should be less risk than investing in real estate that has a major need for value add or that needs to be built from the ground up. So that's really why our focus is cash flow. And, and what about, um, uh, can you talk to address maybe some of the returns that some of the, the investors are getting? Sure. So there's there's always the caveat that you know nothing's guaranteed, and I, I grew up in the regulatory business, so I, I always hesitate to, to share any any conceptualization of returns. But you know we're, we're typically in the eight to ten percent cash on cash range, and we underwrite to a fifteen to eighteen percent IRR. So for our equity transactions, if you take into context the appreciation of those properties, or rather the projected appreciation of those properties, we're looking to hit fifteen to eighteen percent returns after those properties are resold. And is there an opportunity, let's say someone is invested in that, in the, the SPV, is there an opportunity then for them, uh, for a set of so thinking out, you know, out, out loud uh, with respect to a secondary market, you know, do you see that eventually developing? Yeah, so I get asked the question, are we going to build the secondary market a lot? And, and my answer to that is, you can't build a secondary market until the primary market is big enough. And I think you see this in, in peer-to-peer -peer lending, and I'm sure Folio can, can chat a little bit more about that. But the primary market, I don't think, is big enough yet. But I think there's absolutely going to be a secondary market in, in real estate private placements and in, in all the private placements that we're going to discuss today. From our very, very first transaction nine months ago, we wrote transfer provisions into our subscription agreements. So I hope that we are one of the first companies that does a transaction on the secondary market, not because it's a bad transaction, but just because the investor has some life event and needs liquidity, right? Whether it's a divorce or a marriage or a baby, you know, individual investors need capital back for various reasons. So I think there will be a secondary market. I think there will be a very robust secondary market. Uh, and I, I hope and urge anybody who's running crowdfunding companies or portals to put transfer provisions in your documents from day one or from today, like have the foresight to know that even if they're not used for another two or three years. But we're, we're putting investors today in transactions that might exist for 10 years and to not have a transfer provision, even if you're not going to make money on it. Like our, our transfer provisions, we don't intend to make money off of them, uh, but it's the right thing to do for investors. You know, thinking about it from a fiduciary perspective, I think you absolutely have to put transfer provisions in your docs. That's great. <coughs> and Tim, can you talk a little bit about how some of the deals are structured on, on micro ventures? Sure. Um, so just like Jillian, we put together special purpose vehicles. We think that that's the only way to remove uh, the, the friction between companies and investors. You know, when you've got thousands of investors potentially coming into a company, um, I think, you know, as, as Blaine and Steve mentioned, you know, the, the conduit's in place. The conduit's been in place for a long time to allow for people to, to do book entry and in street name and all these types of things. That doesn't solve the problem of know your customer and suitability and having toxic investors on your cap table. These companies are new and they're growing and they're fragile and they cannot deal with uh, one investor who's invested $5, you know, calling the CEO five times a day saying, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? You know, you should be doing this differently. And that happens, you know, so. And those are the ones that always call. <laughs> right, so, so being a buffer, creating these special purpose vehicles, and, and of course the investor is not an investor in the company. They're an investor in the vehicle. They own a unit. They don't own a share in the company. But it's the only way to really facilitate a, a smooth interaction um, and allow for these types of transactions to happen in any volume. And as Jillian mentioned, it is new. It's a young market. There isn't a lot of volume. Even though you, know, you could point to numbers, maybe there's a, a billion dollars in transactions. That's a drop in the bucket. You know, there's, there's not enough volume for secondary transactions in this space as well, kind of going back to, the, to Jillian's question. Um, we've done a few unit transfers, but it's, it's very much a, a one-off situation. But our structure is through an SBV as well. Yeah, I think I, I, I read somewhere that, that one of your companies that had one of your crowdfunded companies actually was like the first, um, <coughs> had the first exit. Yeah, we do technically have the, the first exit. It was through M&A, uh, a company called Republic Project. was bought by a public media company uh, about two months ago. So uh, we've got one on the board. And what, 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 what do you anticipate that in investors, how long should they, you know, investing on your platform? What's the length of time you, you, you would basically... I'm going to have to take Jillian's uh, compliant <laughs> route here. Uh, there, there's no guarantee. You know, we try to find companies that are going to potentially have an M&A exit as opposed to an IPO. We think that the returns are better in the three to five year M&A exit range than they are in a 10 to 12 year IPO exit. So um, 
you know, we speak with all of the investors, VCs, you know, other institutions in the area to kind of find out what they're looking for, what kind of companies they're interested in, and, and see if we can do a little bit of matching exercise when we look at companies to see if this is a company that could potentially be acquired in a, in a short period of time. Interesting. Well, I, I also know that, that um, you know, you, you were involved in, in a lot of the um, Facebook and Twitter transactions while they were still private. and. and so I would imagine that that you know you have a um, it, you know a, a, a client base that that should be kind of happy. You know they, they, they had some nice, <laughs> nice 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 exits there. Are they? Do you see them injecting money back into some of these earlier stage um, type of offerings? That you um, not as much as you would think. And I'll, to be honest, a lot of the Facebook people were pretty angry with me mm -hmm. um, until very recently. So I started getting calls. You know about three weeks ago saying, hey, you're a great guy again. Um, <laughs> but um, for a while, it was the, the face plant disaster and people were, you know, pointing fingers at anyone they could because, you know, oh, you lost me money even though I didn't ask you to buy the stock. Um, the, the bottom line, though, is it's probably about 10% of the people that, that bought Facebook and Twitter are dabbling in the early stage space and it's, it's not big dollar amounts, whereas people buying Twitter wanted to put 500000 a million dollars to work People are putting ten to to thirty thousand dollars, you know, per transaction, which is smart because you want to have a diversified portfolio in this space because you know that nine plus out of ten are going to fail. Yeah. Yep. It's definitely a uh, it'd be definitely a different kind of market. So, Blaine, maybe you could talk a, a little bit about how you see some of the the um, how you work with some of the broker dealers and how you, maybe you see some of the small cap underwriters you know, working with you guys and, and getting involved in the market. And if, let's say, you know, a small cap underwriter has a deal that they're taking, how, how could they, you know, work with, with Folio? It's a, a little easier for me to describe the broker-dealer one okay. in that, uh, let's say, Tim wants a back end that takes care of his uh, investor side, N not his dealing with the issuer side per se, but he's got the fund, but he needs to administer the units and do the corporate actions and distributions for the units. A platform like ours is, is one that, that does that. I think Steve's is building in the, along the same direction <laughs> to be able to do the custody and the, and the transactions. Where we, we think that that's valuable is, um, and, and Tim, I'm talking about you because you're here, but also because I know you, you spent a lot of time and effort to put together an, an account structure and a, and a processing infrastructure. So for somebody who's already done that, it's something of a sunk cost. You might keep doing it. But for all the people that are, are getting started in their, their portals and their broker dealers, um, do you really want to have to build from scratch an account structure and a, a custody structure and a funding structure and a tax reporting structure and kind of the list goes on. So I think what we're hoping to do is, is be something of an accelerator. Um, not only a, a common underlying platform that allows for both issuance and secondary transactions, whether they be sort of the death and divorce transfers that we all have to do or the ones that people actually really want to do, which is I'd like to sell now and I'd like to sell at a reasonable price, not a fire sale because I need the money. Um, but to really, to really take that further and, and be an accelerator that allows people to focus on their front end and be able to just sort of buy the back end uh, at a very reasonable price. The, the other piece that, that's in there, and it's, it's, it's as much about initial issuance as it is about secondary transactions to me, is that um, this is an asset class. As a custodian, we support lots of asset classes and we have you know, thousands and thousands of investors and investment advisors who are asking us, well, but how do I invest in the private real estate class? How do I invest in the peer-to-peer -peer class? How do I invest in any of these? And so for us to be able to provide those kind of services or, or any sort of clearing platform, we actually need more of those, those introducers, those, those platforms, those underwriters to use a common platform so that the broader set of investors can access it. Because not, not every investor is going to want to go and open up an account just at that one introducing broker, or just at that, through that one underwriter's deal. They're going to want to have an account where they do all sorts of things. And if you can have that in one place and access all of the assets, that's a lot more powerful interaction that's going to provide a lot more money to those small companies. And, and Steve, maybe you could talk a little bit about how, how you're helping um, the portals and other portals with that back-end type? Yeah, so, you know, our, our, our customers are our portals. Um, they're doing, you know, a variety of different, uh, different asset classes. We provide um, sort of three-pronged services to, to our customers. Um, on one hand, um, we do um, all of the investor 
due diligence. Um, as a FINRA registered broker dealer, we're required to do basic things and you know all sorts of acronyms: KYC, AML, OFAC. Basically, know your customer, anti-money laundering, um, making sure people aren't bad people, terrorists. Um, under 506C, which is what we're talking about right now, there's an additional burden um, on the issuer that we feel it's our responsibility to assist them with. Um, I sort of look at this as the SEC um, when they passed Title II, they said, okay, you've been begging for general solicitation, begging for general solicitation. Here you have it. This is what you asked for. But, um, and the but is um, under 506C, you're no longer allowed to have your investors self accredit. So under 506B, under old style, um, Reg D, an investor could come into your platform and say, you know, go through a questionnaire and say, yes, I make more than $200,000 a year, or I'm worth more than this, and trust me, I'm okay, and boom, they could invest in your deal. Um, with a piper, under 506C, um, the issuer now has a legal responsibility to validate the fact that that person is in fact and accredited investors. So we've got a variety of technology in place that knows how to do, you know, both income and asset-based checks to uh, ensure that the investors are, in fact, accredited. Um, on the issuer side, again, as a federal registered broker-dealer, um, we're required to do a certain amount of reasonable due diligence on the issuer. Um, <clears throat> Our due diligence really is comprised of making sure that the packet that's put together by the issuer is sufficiently detailed, sufficiently complete, that a sophisticated accredited investor could make a smart investment decision. Um, we don't opine on whether it's a good deal or whether or not it's going to go up three times or exit in four years. We just opine on the fact that the packet um, is put together properly. The last thing we do is handle the cash movements between um, the, uh, the investors and the issuers. We do that now through an escrow account. We're working on other mechanisms like what Blaine has developed so that we can be a full clearing broker and actually hold the cash ourselves. That's basically what we do. Well, I think you know you, you bring up a, an interesting point. Just talking about now, the onus is really on the issuer or the or the the BD or the portal to really um, make sure that this is indeed an accredited investor. You know, uh, and and now there's there's more um, it, more requirements for the investor. You know, they need tax returns and and other things. So. Maybe Tim, you are, 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 are you know have you been finding that investors are basically saying you know I'm not providing that you know is there a, a reluctance on their part? Yeah, there definitely is a is a reluctance um, to hand off the information to their financial advisor or or their banker to to get that information. Um, I think it's it's something you know that hasn't kind of reached its tipping point yet. I think that. <coughs> Uh, it, it will, you know, just like Mint.com where people have entered their information and, and have a full comprehensive view of their assets and that sort of thing. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come around into the, into the crowdfunding space. Uh, something that Steve mentioned about due diligence that I think is really important. Um, a lot of the platforms out there that aren't broker dealers, dealers don't have the burden of due diligence. So they're not actually doing line by line financial analysis. They're not uh, doing criminal background checks on the principles. They're not checking the, the channels and vendors and partners and other people that are uh, potentially major growth limiting factors in that business. Um, if somebody isn't doing that and they're offering a deal, no investor can actually make an educated investment decision about that company. So I think due diligence is a, is a critical component that is lacking in a lot of the platforms out there today. Well, and also, you know, aren't there a, a the rules are a lot stricter for bad actors. Maybe you could talk a little bit if someone wants to talk about how that's sort of affecting and changing things now for doing these deals. Well, yeah, so you know, the, I guess sort of the, the second gotcha, right, in, 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 in Title II was, was that the, 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 there needs to be a, a deeper bad actor check on the principles um, of of the company, which, you know, was previously sort of a light exercise. But again, agreeing that, that doing these kinds of checks and um, diligence and background checks um, on the, the, the companies and the, the principles, I, th I think, is really going to be a key to the success of the industry. I mean, I think everybody up here would agree that um, the industry is going to thrive when lots of good companies raise money and lots of good companies do good things, whether it's exit or just continue to be alive, um, you know, to the extent that we can keep fraud out of this, it benefits everybody. So, you know, agree wholeheartedly that this is really important. And what do you guys feel about um, syndicates? 
and and you know and partnering with other broker dealers or or um, you know I get have to be licensed at this point you know maybe once Title Three is implemented and there's a certain kind of uh, they're under a certain kind of regulatory umbrella but you know put coming together just you know just like we saw you know the old syndicates like Microsoft with 119 different underwriters I mean do you think that this market will grow through we're, syndicates we're already doing syndication Dara okay. I, I, I think that actually syndication is really important um, in the 506 C 506 B space um, I think that Every one of our customers brings a sort of unique kind of investor, a unique kind of issue. Um, and if you just sat on one platform all day long, um, you'd be going, you know, you'd have a very undiversified um, investment style um, because the portals tend to, tend, to, tend to have certain types of companies they like to bring, like the high-tech companies that you're speaking of, right? So if I just stayed all day long on your platform, I would not have a very diversified um, investment um, strategy. I'd like to be able to get some of Jillian's um, income producing products to sort of, you know, de-risk the high um, risk things that I'm doing. So we've already got a number of syndication agreements between our portals, between portals and portals, between portals and broker dealers, between portals and sort of high touch investment banking firms that are out there doing the old style pick up the phone call for the, the deal. So big believer in syndication from us. And you know, and another thing, not only partnering, BD partnering with each other, but even like maybe Blaine partnering with, with Folio. I mean, here's, you know, an opportunity for the BD to really have a new a new revenue line. Um, you know, they they don't have to leave money on, on the table by not, you know, part, they could now basically participate in these smaller deals. And if you guys are taking some of the, um, you know, the compliance stress away from them, you know, they, they basically have, you know, an opportunity, you know, we have the technology and they have the, the, the compliance piece. I mean, you know, they, you know, they, they could basically just bring their market and, and you know, and capture new revenue and by getting involved in some of these smaller deals. What do you guys think about that? I think it's a little bit laughable that um, the word syndicate seems like a new word all of a sudden. <laughs> you know, <laughs> syndicates have been around forever and, uh, and, and, you know, you could call what we're doing syndication, right? Um, the new term syndicate that I think you're referring to is anyone in this room can go out and get followers, you know, over the internet and get them to follow them into deals blindly. Right, well, what they're doing an angel is. On that platform, right? Um, yeah. um, I think that's yeah. I think that's a really bad idea. I, I think that managing investors and going back to what Jillian said about K ones and, and other things is a pain in the neck. You know, um, it, it's it's really neat to think you can follow you know investor X who's been successful because they invested in Twitter and and whatever um, into a deal and that they can have eight hundred thousand dollars following them into whatever company they want. That is a terrible investment strategy, and and the word syndicate, I think, uh, needs to <laughs> rise up and get back to its roots, which is you know professional supervised syndication. Right. So just just the, the sell side syndicates. Yeah. yeah. Just just to be clear, Tim, that's that's I'm a, I'm an old style broker. Oh no, I, I that's that's I know. that's that's yeah. the way I'm using the word, right? right. The, the, yep. the 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 traditional model, not the not the right. new sort of follow. The you know we've got. We've got, you know, organized syndication agreements between, you know, ourselves and the other intermediaries, just like, you know, if everything was being sold offline. Yeah. Well, let's open it up to a couple of questions. Yeah. You said it's up to, in a pipe, it's up to the um, issuer to make sure the investors are accredited. Is there any kind of a third-party service that you can go to to do the accrediting of the investors? You said it. Yeah. I said it. Yeah, there, 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 there are a couple of different third-party services um, that are around to do that. Um, we work with uh, with a firm called Crowd Bouncer um, that I could speak to you about. But there are a couple of other people. Um, our our feeling is that you actually need more than one service um, because nobody's gonna nobody's. It's not sort of one size fits all in terms of how you do that. Some people won't want to give you their tax returns. Some people won't want to provide a statement from the CPA. So. It takes, takes a little bit of work to, uh, to, 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 to do that properly, but Krebby after was happy to have a more detailed conversation with you. 
Yeah, the other thing I'd add to that is that the regulation does allow for the issuer to rely upon the broker dealer that they're working with, whether it be the uh, the introducing broker or the clearing broker. So <laughs> it's our expectation that in most of those cases, the, the broker dealer or us as a clearing broker will do the accreditation verification on behalf of the issuer and then just provide the answer back. And you're allowed to rely upon that and have solid deals at that point. So whether we do it ourselves or whether we use a crowd check, crowd bounce, early IQ, there, there are a number of, of people who are, who are popping up in the space and doing some good work there. Um, but our intent there is to provide you packages where you don't have to sort of find the 10 suppliers necessary to do a deal. You find the one or two suppliers necessary to do a deal, and they've already done the back end work. Yeah, that's that's our model as well, yeah. right? Yeah. We, don't, we don't expect the issues to do that. We're, we're streaming. Coming back to the question of the use of SVPs and pass through vehicles here and secondary offerings and trading, at what point does the IRS look at, you know, the IRS has all these funny rules that are in the tax code about uh, uh, pass through vehicles and how they're taxed if there's free trading and the underlying equity interest? They like to tax the C corporations and lose the pass through characters. At what point do they look at secondary markets and the ability of shareholders to cash their interests of um, these SPDs, SPDs from one party to another and say, hey, wait a second, you know, we're going to start taxing you at the corporate level, at the SPD level, because if you were sent over to that, that makes so I am not an accountant, nor am I a CPA. Um, so I'll, I'll caveat it as I do with that. But our, ours are structured through LLCs, and their tax is partnerships. So they're. So we haven't dealt with it yet, um, so I can't give you a, a perfect guidance on that. But the, the one word that really stuck out to me as you were describing that was freely. Um, these assets are not freely transferable, right? They, they, that's, that's my word, not the IRS. Okay. Well, I, I don't know the tax code uh, as well as you do, but I, I think it's something that we have to deal with, right? I mean, there are issues like this that come up time and time again as, as the CEO of these crowdfunding companies that people haven't dealt with before in this capacity. Uh, and, and the number one thing is disclosure, right? Making sure that investors understand that, making sure that if there are transfers, the investors understand what the implications of that are going to be. Um, again, we haven't, we haven't facilitated a transfer, so I don't know, Tim, if you have more guidance on that, but it, it's one of those things that you have to solve for and one of those things that the industry as a whole is going to have to solve for. And, and, and you know, to, to agree with all your, all your points, the industry has shown a, you know, a, a somewhat unique ability to figure it out as we go, right? I mean, this whole thing is evolving, right? So your structure didn't exist a year ago. I mean, everything's, everything's evolving and growing. So, you know, we'll figure it out. I think the only other piece is, you know, well, we, we do our best to provide as much information and education as we can about the current tax environment. We're not tax advisors or tax attorneys, and we encourage, you know, both sides, all parties to consult with their tax advisors and attorneys on any transaction or transfer to see where things stand, because the tax laws are changing every day. Okay, one more question. I have a question for Jillian. Uh, curious as to your business model, how do you make money? Is it just a fee on the money you raise, or do you get a piece of the um, equity? What's your economic... Sure. So our, our economics are slightly different in our debt model and in our equity model. In our debt model, it's very similar to the, the Lending Club and the Prospers of the World where we charge an origination fee and we charge a spread, a servicing spread. So if we originate a loan at you know 10% and we pass through 9% to the investor, we're making 1% there. On origination, you know we're usually making 2 or 3%. And just a quick note on regulation, there are certain states that we can lend in and certain states that we cannot lend in. 
So we're a licensed DRE broker in California. Uh, there are certain states that allow you to facilitate non-owner-occupied lending and other states that won't. Arizona and Nevada, for example, are, are two states that we can't lend in due to the regulations. Uh, and then on the equity side, we run an asset management model. So we charge a fee on an annual basis to the investor for operating the SPV, running distributions, running reporting, and then also running K-1s and tax documentation for the investor. So you don't get anything up front for the equity raise for, the, for your sponsor partner? Uh, historically, we've charged a, a due diligence fee, so a flat fee that doesn't move based on the size of the transaction. Uh, there's a number of different ways that you can structure that. You know, through a broker-dealer, you can charge a percentage basis. So, you know, a lot of the other portals are charging 3% or 4% or 5%. We don't currently operate under that structure. Okay. I was just curious why you wouldn't take a piece of the, of the uh, promoter. So on, on the back end, uh, on some of our transactions, we have taken a piece of the promote. Uh, our, the largest transaction that we've done to date was a shopping center outside of no Northern California, outside of San Francisco. Tenants were CVS, Safeway, Starbucks, Subway. And on that transaction in particular, we're a part of the management team. So we actually have oversight on the property. We're approving annual budgets. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot more than we do on some of our other real estate transactions. As party to the management team, we have a piece of promote on the back end on that transaction. Uh, there's, there's legislation that doesn't allow us to do that if we're not part of the management team on some of our transactions. So it just depends on how involved we're going to be in the transaction. Uh, we were the majority equity shareholder in that specific transaction. So we thought that we should hold on to that fiduciary duty and, and stay a part of the management team, which is what we did. Thank you. Thanks. That's all we have time for for this first panel. But our, our panelists are around, so feel free to you know, just ask some questions throughout the day. And we're going to jump right into the next session. Thank you so much, guys. That was great. Thank you, Derek.